All right, Matt, you are back. I'm back. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm so excited. As I always say, you're my favorite Pearl expert. So oh, it's going to be good. You. It's going to be good today. Um, so if you guys didn't see, this is the second time Matt has been on the podcast. You know, Matt, I think I told you this too. Your episode is my most listened to episode on Spotify. That's awesome. Yeah. I wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People love it. I mean, and, and you have such a, you have such a fun and interesting way of just sharing what you know. Uh, I think some of the comments I saw, they said, wow, he's so passionate about this. He's such a good storyteller. And people were just so impressed with your knowledge. So I just want to commend you on that because people just love you. <laughs> Oh, that makes me feel really good. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those things. It's corny, they say, but you do what you're passionate about uh, and it shows. Um, so I'm talking about uh, people say, what do you do for work? And like, my work is my passion. And like, oh, what's your hobby? It's like, well, my work is my hobby. It's everything. I love it. I love this stuff. Yeah, well, it definitely shows. So uh, saying that, you did get uh, some questions. So I want to make sure those questions get answered because they were directed, you know, specifically towards you. Okay. I'll try my best. Lay it on me. If I don't know, I'll just tell you I don't know and I'll find out. Okay. So uh, this one was left on the video and this is a question from Anne and she says, I hope he comes back and talks about the history of pearl growing technology because for vintage jewelry lovers, that is huge. Miriam Haskell would have used real pearls, but they could not make that big of pearls back then without a huge price tag. Even now, she says it would be hard. So she really wants you to kind of talk about pearl technology and maybe how that is intertwined with vintage jewelry. I, I think I know what she's getting at, and I apologize if I'm not reading you right, um, but it, here's just the lay of the land in terms of real pearls and manufactured pearls and pearl technology could be applied to both. So um, when you had like Coco Chanel making pearls really famous, you know, starting around like the um, end of prohibition, um, these were manufactured pearls, right? And there's different types of manufactured pearls that rely on their quality based off of how technology is. And they could be glass or they could be plastic. Uh, in one case, there's a company that uses like a fish scale paste to actually put on the outside of it to give it that grittiness that you would get when you would, um, you know, test for a real pearl to, to try to simulate the weight of real pearls. Uh, so there's all different sorts of qualities of faux pearls. Uh, and so I'm not sure if you're talking about, you know, the technology in that, or if it's more like the technology we see in diamonds where you can actually lab create a diamond now, and it is a diamond. It's chemically the same thing. Uh, but it's created by a machine and it's not mined from the earth. Uh, so that's really shaken up the diamond world lately. In the pearl world, technology as it comes to uh, pearls that come from mollusks, living creatures, uh, the biggest advancement in that has been over in like the last 15-ish years where um, the freshwater pearls, which you might be alluding to uh, as well, um, were made without a nucleus. Uh, well, they used a piece of mantle tissue rather than a bead nucleus. Uh, and for decades, uh, freshwater pearls coming out of China were kind of like small and kind of potato shaped or rice shaped, and they've never really got big or nice and lustrous. Uh, and so there's a very clear distinction between freshwater pearls and then the pearls that came from the South Seas, Tahiti, uh, and Japan, for example, because the quality difference was so huge and you just look at it and say, right, hey, that's easily in a koya from Japan. Today, uh, the technology in growing uh, nucleated freshwater pearls has advanced so much and they even control like the nutrients in the water. Uh, they're putting one bead in per mollusk rather than 20. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of secrets we don't even know about how they're made uh, because they don't want to share them. But uh, the the uh, what's happening is they're producing pearls that rival in my opinion, the look of South Seas pearls and Akoya pearls. So to give an example, I took uh, a one of these nucleated pearls 
uh, around to a bunch of pearl experts uh, maybe two years ago and asked them if it was what they call an Edison pearl. Those, those are nicknamed Edison pearls or an Akoya. Uh, and, and maybe like seven, eight experts, about half of them thought it was Edison, about half of them thought it was Akoya without really looking at it any, any closer. So you might be talking about that too. So I'd say that's the biggest change in pearl technology uh, lately is then the uh, introduction of Edison pearls. I know one store that sold a strand of Edison pearls, these freshwater pearls for $18,000 a year ago, uh, which has got to be a record for those. Uh, and I've got strands myself that are on my website for seven or $8,000. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I hope that All answers right. your question. Yes, I hope so too. And you can uh, let us know. <laughs> All right, so the next question I got, this was from a message from my friend Lynn, and she wants to know, um, if we talked about which pearls glow under a black light. So are there pearls that glow under a, bla a black light and which ones are they? Yeah, the uh, Sia Cortez pearls are known for glowing under UV light uh, and they're gorgeous by the way. Uh, oh. And um, you know, most people don't know about Sia Cortez pearls. Um, I've got a few around. I don't have any on my head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually have some because they're so pretty and I plan on making some earrings with a few that I bought recently. Um, and it's interesting that you talk about that because later when we get to, uh, say, costume jewelry and evaluating stuff in the wild, too, uh, there's a lot of gemstones that glow under UV. And I actually carry this thing around. Um, where's the camera? Um, this is a light that I take everywhere I go if I'm buying any sort of estate stuff because it's got three different strengths of UV and it's got red and it's got different levels of whites and this thing's like a dream. You can also use this, by the way, to help not fully evaluate, but help you evaluate, say, diamonds or um, oh, really? created uh, other gemstones. Yeah. So will you be able to uh, share a link to that? Because I know people are probably going to want to buy this. I have thing. a feeling. Yeah. I mean, I did this. <laughs> I did a YouTube last night on pearls and jade. And at the end, the host hung up and she said, um, can you share links for all that stuff? And I'm like, I really should get a list of links because. Yes. Um, yes. Or at least, you know, maybe you can let us know the brand name or something. And then I can, yeah, I'll I can, have to, well, I can the, it, it up. it's all in Chinese. So I really don't know the brand name, but uh, <laughs> I can send you. Where, where did you find it? Like on Amazon or something? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, okay. That's good. So uh, the answer, Lynn, is yes. And Matt actually has some of those pearls that glow in the black light. So hopefully yeah, you can post think, a picture of it on I'm Instagram. Think of any other pearls uh, fluoresce? Um, I don't really recall or what treatment they would make them fluoresce. Uh, it, may, it might be something that I'll check into a little bit more and see. Something tells me that there's some sort of treatment to, to pearls that would fluoresce, but off the top of my head, I can't think of what that is. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm sure we'll find out, you know, and then, like I said, maybe you can post it on Instagram or something and, and then we can see what you have. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Wasn't too bad. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that will help, you know, answer the questions or hope it was what, you know, the answer that they were looking for. So, all right, let's go ahead and get into the juicy topic for today, which is why you decided to come back. And I'm so grateful you did, because we're going to talk about how you do reselling as it relates to your business, your system, your processes. So um, I really don't know where we would start with that, but maybe you can give us a general overview of what your business looks like as a reseller or reselling yeah yeah that is a good place to start maybe then uh we didn't come by the way everybody with like a, a script or an agenda or anything we just talk because we realized it worked so good last time and so you know me as the pearl guy and i love pearls and uh i've got a business selling and designing pearls and talking about pearls and giving speeches about pearls uh, but um also, every day I run a jewelry consignment business. So it's a little bit different than uh, being a resale business, but it's kind of similar in the sense that people get a hold of me. Uh, and it's less than me. I'm not really going out to the estate sales much. I'll do that when I can because it's fun. Um, I've, it, it, enough people just come to me that I don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, but it's as with many of you that may be watching this, I'm seeing things that I have the opportunity to consign or to buy, 
and I need to determine what it is and how much I should pay for it. Right. And so any of you guys that are watching that have been out there to these estate sales and whatnot know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, when you pick up, say, the gold necklace, is it gold? Is it plated? Is it 10 carat, 14 carat, whatever? Um, how much is it worth? How much should you pay for it? Uh, colored stones, we do a lot of colored stones. Those get really interesting and sometimes very difficult. Uh, but we're evaluating all that as well. And as a matter of fact, just this morning, I spent all morning evaluating a collection um, that was, it made me think of what we're about to talk about today, because this is exactly what we did. It was we had to look carefully at each piece and evaluate it. If you get good at evaluating this stuff, two things happen. Number one, you're buying it at the right price, right? And mm -hmm. you can also sell it at the right price and not leave any money at the table. Uh, but you'll also find things that are complete gems that, um, you know, I've had people, uh, a guy came to me the other day with his Tahitian pearls and he bought them for 12 bucks at an estate sale and, and I'm sorry, South Seas pearls. And they were large gray. Uh, they, I'd probably sell them for $5,500. So, and this guy, wow. it happens to him all the time. And he always brags about a guy in town uh, and he's probably watching this, Andy, and good for you. You're doing great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and comes and brags to me about it. So that's what I do um, besides pearls. And it helps me with pearls too, because what quite often what I get are people with pearls that you can't buy. So for example, this little guy I brought it to show you, it is a Phoenix with a natural pearl belly that's probably made in the early 1900s. Oh. Uh, and this is something that, you know, you just don't, don't find now. So you get all these really fascinating old things. You guys that are doing resellers have seen all the old stuff. You know what I mean? Um, and I love- Yeah, I don't see that kind of pictures. stuff frequently though well yeah, sometimes you do sometimes you yeah don't. yeah yeah you're right it's kind of like a hit or miss thing i mean sometimes you'll just see a ton of gorgeous stuff and sometimes you don't so <laughs> but on that one for example i i knew it had gold i knew there was diamonds emeralds and rubies in it but the big key was what kind of pearl is it is it a natural pearl or freshwater pearl because a natural pearl is going to sell for much much more than a freshwater pearl uh, so I had to make that determination, which incidentally you can't make. Uh, so the only way I could have done that was to send it to the lab. And so I sent that to GIA. Let me see better on that side. Oh, well, okay. Uh, to determine, sure enough, it was a natural pearl. So now when I sell it, I can sell it for the appropriate price, but I also can give them the GIA lab report so they know that it really is a natural pearl. Now, in that particular case, here's the great thing about consignment is that um, I didn't have to buy it. Now I could have, I could have just offered her whatever a freshwater pearl would be worth, which would be much less. Uh, but I said, let's take them on consignment. I'll send it to GIA. You just pay for the evaluation, which I think was like 90 bucks. Uh, and then when we get it back, we'll price it. So now we've got this priced at 1800 bucks rather than, um, I don't know, 200 bucks uh, because she's got this and she'll do better and I'll do better. Wow. Okay. So then as it relates to you sourcing stuff, like you said, people are bringing stuff to you now, but I mean, do you have the volume of that enough to, to really hit what you're trying to do with your consignment selling business? Because um, mm -hmm. a lot of us, the way we kind of structure it, and maybe it's, Maybe it's up. It probably is a lot different than how you approach it. But what we do is we try to figure out what's the income goal we want to make. Then we try to figure out what do we need to do to get there? How many sales or, you know, how much listings you have to do today or whatever the case may uh -huh. be. So how do you approach that since you don't technically have to really source? You don't have to like go out and find inventory, right? Is that correct? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't have to, I enjoy doing that. It's just mm -hmm. that yeah, I'm lucky enough to where I, I have so much coming in. Um, and, and I think, and this may be an advice for some of you guys, if you want to, but volume wise, let remind me of that in a second. Okay. Step back. Cause this actually, this, these things work together. So, um, I, yes, the, I have way more than enough pieces. Way more, I have actually too much to handle is the problem. Uh, and, you know, mm. we don't tend to set the daily sales goal. Um, you know, maybe I should. Um, but on the other hand, my problem is I have so much stuff that I have a hard time getting the word out there and selling it. So we're actually building a website that we didn't have before right now. Uh, and we're really going to be pushing that uh, because 
the volume is just such there. I probably, you know, just in, this isn't even one fifth of what I have in say colored stone rings, you know, for sale right now. Wow. Um, and I have maybe- You five, have the problem we want to have. <laughs> five trays of that. Yeah, I've got an eight and a half carat diamond. Um, I've got, you know, this 10 carat, you know, ruby and gold bracelet and um, it, all this stuff. It's That's going amazing. on and on. I have trays of engagement rings. Um, so what, two things, I get sent people, I think because I've developed a reputation in town as being somebody that's effective at doing this. And it took a while, that doesn't come overnight um, because I've been doing this for four years. And I think what happened then is as I get a reputation of being successful, word gets out and even in Austin, it's it's a big city, but it's a small town, especially when it comes to jewelry. And a lot of you may live in places that are kind of like that. Jewelers tend to know each other. And I recommend maybe getting to know if you want to emulate what I'm doing with this, it's it's really easy uh, and nobody else does it in town. So, well, I mean, there's a few people that do, but um, I don't know, I feel not like us. Anyways, I created a reputation with the jewelers in town with a lot of them to where they know now when somebody comes in and says, hey, I've got this, you know, tourmaline gold bracelet I want to sell. A lot of jewelry stores aren't buying off the street. So they still want to serve the customer though. So what they do is they just send them to me. They say, well, go see Matt because he does consignment. Then they come to me, I consign it, I sell them and I write them the check uh, and everybody's happy. And I think that that's happened enough time that that's why I don't necessarily have to worry about deal flow because I just get calls from, from people or, you know, there's word of mouth, uh, you know, I'm successful selling something and somebody, you know, tells me about somebody else. Uh, I sold a bracelet the other day for, I think it was $13,000 uh, diamond bracelets for a girl and she was just so happy about it. Uh, so I met her, gave her the I check. Bet. And now I'm getting people calling, you know, saying, hey, so-and-so sent me because, you know, you do this well. So it can go pretty quickly that you, you can build up a reputation quickly, but that's how my deal flow comes in. All right. So, but you also have the parallel business of, of your pearl stuff too, mm -hmm. right? So does any of that kind of overlap in the sense of, of, you know, people finding you and, and getting to know you and trusting you? Cause I know that's a big thing too, you know, trusting, finding someone you trust. Yeah. Especially you know, in jewelry. Mm -hmm, it's exactly. all about trusting this business. And that's what I love about it is that, I can call somebody and get a million dollar diamond sent to me without any paperwork uh, to borrow, to show to somebody. Uh, and that's what's so cool about the jewelry business. And um, I love it that it's still that way. But as such, you know, you need to be a trustworthy person and treat people right uh, and be a person of your word and pay. Uh, so pearls actually overlap quite a bit. And the what happens is that I'll get people that will say, bring this bracelet or a bunch of jewelry in, and we start talking about pearls. They find that pearls are like my expertise. And then in almost every case, they say, oh my gosh, I have some pearls at home that grandma gave me or whoever. And then I meet them again and they bring me pearls. So a lot of the pearls that I have are not just my designs, uh, but I sell a ton of estate pearls that I buy from people as well. Um, or consign from people as well. Now the converse happens where when people buy pearls from me and they find out that I'm also dealing with uh, estate consignment jewelry, quite often I'll get the call after they had such a great pearl experience of something like, I'm looking for a uh, diamond tennis bracelet for my wife for Christmas. And uh, you know, so we it, it goes both ways. They work together great. All right, so now you mentioned um, a little bit about pricing. Let's talk about that. Like, mm -hmm. how do you figure out how to price your items? Or is it kind of like an individual kind of thing? Or That's hard, like how, isn't it? How do you figure? Yeah, because that seems yeah. to be a, a lot of us struggle with that, you know, yeah. especially if it's something so unique and you don't have any comps to compare it to. Or um, if, if, if you just don't know, you know, and you don't want to overprice, you don't want to underprice, but at the same time, you still want to, you know, <laughs> make it worth your time, right? So how do you figure that out? Uh, I make ma mistakes a lot. And you, know, you will overprice and you will underprice, and it's just the way it is. And you're going to lose money on stuff sometimes, you know, um, just make sure it's, you make money on more things than you lose money on. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of trial and error, and mm -hmm. I'm definitely not right on it at all. I mean, I don't see how it could be, especially when we're reselling. See, there's a lot of people that are experts on emeralds that sell emeralds all day long. 
and or wholesalers and emeralds, for example, and they can tell you the price per carat of an emerald that's a type one, type two, or type three from Colombia, come Zambia, whether it's more as an emerald cut or whatever. Um, you know, the, the the hues of color, how that affects price, and they'll be able to tell you exactly how much that should sell for. But these are people that spend their life doing emeralds, right? And you've got the same people in rubies and in in cost trafariers, costume jewelry. Uh, so when you're like us in the resale world, we need to be kind of experts at everything. And um, I think that's pretty crazy. And, you know, nobody can expect you to be an expert at everything. So I've learned if I don't have experience with it, I just ask. And I, I like to, you know, put myself some communities of people and other experts that have a help each other out attitude where you can just ask. So there's a lot of online groups I'm in uh, on Facebook where I can say, take, here's one, for example, a, I took this out of a necklace the other day because I didn't like it. I'm just being honest. I'm not an amethyst guy. <laughs> Anyways, it's a, uh, an amethyst drop. It's very beautiful. Yeah. And it's 15 carats. How much should we sell it for? Right. It's hard to tell. So in order to know, it's not just an amethyst. You have to tell it, the, what kind of color is, what the saturation is. And as you move it around, does it have those flashes of like purplish red? Uh, and it can be all over the map. Uh, but I wouldn't know when I started. I mean, I had some notion, but some people would think five bucks a carat. Some people would think a hundred bucks a carat. Um, so what I do is I'll go out to stone dealer groups that I know of uh, and just write a note saying, hey, guys, can you help me out? Uh, and you'll get advice. And then if somebody needs advice about pearls, I'm giving them the advice about pearls. So I think surrounding yourself with people that can give you advice is, is, is key for that. Get in some of these Facebook groups if you guys aren't in them already. There's a lot of reseller groups. I, I can think of one, um, Texas Gals. Do you know mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, she's she's one of my favorites and she's pretty well known. I think almost every, yeah. <laughs> every jewelry reseller. Knows and then of course, her, her there's group. There's always research. So eBay, if you get like a brand name in like a David Yurman bracelet or something like that, you can go to eBay and you'll see that mm -hmm. same David Yurman or James Avery or any of those things. And you can see if everybody's selling that little gold pendant for 200 bucks uh, on eBay, you can and you can price yours at 150, then you're probably gonna be just fine uh, if you want to sell it quick. It also depends in any business how fast you want to turn your inventory. Uh, and what sort of margin do you have? And is that okay with you? So I'll price things depending on cash flow quite often too. Uh, I sold a bunch of gold last week when it hit uh, just about 2,200 uh, that I sold it pretty much at melt, which I can normally get a premium for, but it had raised up quite a bit and I had other things I wanted to pay for. So even if maybe I could get 5% more, who knows later for that, um, I'd rather have the cash now because it enables me to pay bills for other inventory I just bought and then sell that quicker at a higher margin. So cash flow has to do with pricing, um, your expertise, expertise or, or advice from other people. It's, it's not an easy question, you know? Yeah. And I think it's going to be different for everybody because not everybody's working within the same parameters as it relates to incoming inventory, as it relates to uh, where they're selling, because sometimes you can get a very different price online than you can in person or even uh, reselling platforms. Sometimes you can get more on one platform versus another. Right. So, yeah. Speaking of eBay, is that a, a place where you sell your jewelry or do you no. just do it? Price checking. Offline? I price check on eBay. Yeah, no, I do comparative shopping. On eBay. I, I don't try. I tried selling a watch there once like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about eBay because I don't have experience selling <laughs> on eBay. Right. Uh, I, I know they take a cut. Um, I know. They all do. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I've <laughs> heard on the negatives that you can get stuck with the bill sometimes on disputes. Um I, again, without knowing too much detail, I don't want to talk too much about the negatives, but I, I, I don't do it. Uh, I do sell a little bit on um, first dibs. And what I sell on first dibs tends to be brand name stuff um, that is of higher value because there's first dibs shoppers that have no problem spending $10,000 while they're you know sipping a glass of wine on their computer at night. Uh, so I tend to try to sell higher volume things there or uh, higher price things there. Um, you know, and things like emeralds and sapphires and um, Tiffany and all that sort of stuff. Uh, on Facebook now, they have been cracking down on people like you and me selling anything brand name uh, and, and deleting accounts. 
Uh, so right. I've heard that in many groups, whereas I, for, I don't know why first dibs can sell at Tiffany and company, but that we can't on Facebook. Uh, but I've heard of that as well. So I push a lot of that stuff to first dibs. So first dibs, uh, and Instagram and word of mouth is where we sell a lot, a lot of stuff and I keep a mailing list. And so another smart thing to do is as you guys get customers, absolutely keep that customer's information around because a lot of them will become regulars and there's no problem at all texting them or sending an email later saying, Hey, I just got this really cool bracelet that I think you would be interested. What do you think? And seeing what they say, we get a lot of repeat customers that way. Yeah, I do the same thing. And I always, you know, I let them know, I say, Hey, I'm giving you, you know, first, <laughs> you know, first shot at this, if you're interested, if not, you know, I'll go ahead and list it somewhere else. But, it, you know, I know this is your style or your taste or whatever. And I thought yeah. I'd give you first look and they appreciate, they appreciate that. They love it. They say, Oh, wow. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then guess what they think of you when they're looking for something on top of that too. They're like, Oh, True. You should call Desiree. Yeah. Yeah, I need to get more of those though. You know, I need to get <laughs> I need to get a lot more of those. So um, yeah. I've got I've got a few people that do like most of it's like in any business they say that like 20% of your buyers, you know, or 80% of your business. And it's so true. And luckily I've got those customers that are great. Uh, but you know, I I'm trying to truly match them to things that they like and so they appreciate it and they know I'm not gonna offer them something that's just there to sell, but you know, that I thought of them, you know, for that that I matched up. All right, so let's talk about that now. Then your, um, I guess your target customer or your ideal buyer or client. Do you have like a specific um, customer that you're targeting? Because I know I've talked about that on the podcast before, where mm -hmm. um, another reselling friend of mine, she targets a specific woman who likes a specific brand who likes to spend a specific amount. Are you that targeted when it comes to your buyers? No, I mean, I think I could see that being great if you really did have that customer uh, that is spending X amount of money with you every month, no matter what, for the most part, then sure, I would be looking for things for that customer. Um, I, I, we just have a lot of stuff. And so I mean, we have, I tend not to necessarily look for things for a customer. And then again, keep in mind, most of the stuff I'm not looking for is just coming across my desk. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely quite often there's something that comes in uh, and uh, I had a brooch the other day come in and I have this wonderful customer who's a good friend named Ina and um, the brooch came in. I'm like, this is totally an Ina brooch. I just like know it. And usually I can know exactly what Ina's going to like. Uh, and I was so excited. But in this case, the guy decided not to consign it and he took it home. He says, you know, I'll just keep it. So. Um, so yeah, things will happen like that sometimes where I have somebody in mind in particular, but here's the other thing that, that I do that I, I don't know if any of the stuff I'm doing, by the way, guys is right or wrong. Just let me put it that way. Cause <laughs> I'm not saying it's, I'm doing things the right way, but I'll buy things sometimes or consign them. And has this ever happened to you? Like you love it. Right. And then you think this thing is great. I'm even going to overpay for it because it's going to sell and then nobody wants it. And you realize it's just something that you like that nobody else likes. Oh yeah, that's happened more times than I probably can count. <laughs> yeah, me too. It, Absolutely. And then, then you get the stuff that you're like, oh, I don't think this is going to sell, and then uh, somebody buys it right and away. And that's so. the stuff that yeah, people are clamoring over. Yes, I can't Absolutely. figure that one out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and there's some things too where I think, well, I don't think that many people will want this, you know. So I I, I buy it with with the intent that if it doesn't sell, I'll keep it for myself. And then that's the thing that seems to be the most popular. That's the thing that, you know, gets bid up, you know, so you it's really weird because you can never really. I mean, I think I, I have a good instinct or, you know, intuition on certain things, but there's other things that I've been so off the mark that I even <laughs> kind of surprise myself. Yeah, now I guess none of us can really call it right, but it's fun. I have I have a 57, I think, carrot, sapphire, chucky doll pendant that is in a drawer over here <laughs> Really? <laughs> that I bought like four years ago. And I tried selling them like two or three times, kind of putting out there with no bites. And I was thinking this guy is going to go so fast. So he's my, uh, I think you just need the right buyer for that because you do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and I'm thinking something like that probably is like seasonal too, like maybe around Halloween time, that would be good. And then there's people who like, like, is it haunted? Is it a haunted jewelry piece? 
<laughs> no, well, you know, Chucky, he was in that, whatever, he was like yes. 10 different movies. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it looks just like Chucky and he's like that tall and you wear him as a pendant and it's by that famous company called Icebox that makes all those iced out pendants. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he's got a really big hole in his head. So you can put that big gold cube in and through his head and hang it. Well, it's I asked if it's cool. I asked if it's haunted because there's people who specifically want haunted jewelry. There's oh. a whole market of, there's a whole market in, um, they're called like oddities, right? And there's people who want the weird, the bizarre, the haunted, anything kind of having to do with paranormal creepiness. So, I didn't so know that. I, yeah. So huh. I say that because you may just not be putting it in front of the right eyes. Because to me, I know a group on Facebook where you could drop that in there and they'd be fighting over it because they like that kind of stuff. Anything that's weird, creepy. Bizarre. I wonder how like those hair lockets would do like the um, morning pieces. I've got one from uh -huh. the 1700s. Yeah. And it's got hair in it to me. That's what I kind of, yes. creepy. but I get those all yes. the time. Too. Huh. See, I'm, I'm totally into that. I love anything that's weird, strange, off the wall, kind of weird. <laughs> that's my thing. I really like that kind of stuff. So I know right. there's other people like there, like me who, and they take it probably further than I do. But there's all kinds of jewelry that's like that. There's uh, jewelry made from blood. There's jewelry made from uh, cremation ashes. There's jewelry yeah. made from hair. And like you said, like, so there's there's a whole market of people who like that kind of stuff. And like I said, just like there's a market for um, haunted dolls. People love that. People like haunted jewelry too. And you can even look, search on eBay and people will say, this jewelry piece could be haunted because I keep finding it in different places throughout my house. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I do like the skulls. Let me show you something in my hand. See, you can't really see these on this camera very well. The clasp on beautiful. It's actually two gold skulls and you turn the skull sideways to open up this bracelet. So I thought that was really, cool. yeah. I love skull jewelry. I do too. There it is. They even have jewelry made of bugs, Matt. That's so I don't doubt it. There is a guy here in town who's really cool, uh, and he goes to a lot of the jewelry networking things, which I suggest everybody go to those, too. Uh, find mm -hmm. the Women's Jewelry Association in your town. I go to it, and you don't have to be a girl to go to this. Uh, and um, it's such a great networking group. Uh, and just get to know everybody. That's going to help your help your business. Um, uh, but it makes me think, so there's a guy that attends that that does the Ashes Jewelry in town. He's got a big business doing that, and that's all he does. He mm -hmm. does great. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I did a news story uh, not too long ago about breast milk jewelry. That's a thing now, too. That, too. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Like, so, you know, it's it's it, no matter what you do, I think there's going to be somebody out there <laughs> that wants yeah, it, you know. You're right. So, OK, well, let's talk about then how do you. I mean, and you probably, I, I would imagine you don't get this a lot, but like if you have someone who's unhappy or somebody who said, well, this isn't what I wanted or it wasn't what I expected. Like, how do you yeah. handle uh, issues, returns or or any type of problem situation in your reselling business? Because, you know, sometimes that does come up and, and mm. um, it, it's the reality of business, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's different if you're doing it in person than online, because in person, you, you I mean, online, you can expect more returns than in person. Right. Um, and what we always tell people is that since this is consignment jewelry, there is no returns because when they somebody buys this bracelet, I actually own this bracelet. But when somebody buys the consignment piece, we have to write a check to the consigner so we can't take the jewelry back. Uh, and we just explain that to people when we talk to them. So this is like a final sale, just so you know, if you have any questions about it, ask. Uh, and if it's like online, we say if we take perfectly good pictures and we also make sure that every little thing is disclosed. So if there's the littlest dent or a scratch or anything, overdo it and make sure that nobody gets something uh, and you know see something that you didn't disclose. Uh, so I, that's really helped me a lot. We don't, we tell it like it is. Uh, and we'll tell you the quality of, of absolutely everything. Uh, and so as such, you know, we really don't get that very much at all. I have had it happen just a few times. Uh, I would say the retail um, service person in me um, generally says, take the return. Uh, and uh, because it happens. Uh, I, I worked for a... Uh, 
a retail store once and our policy and we grew from, I started with four stores, I believe, and we grew to 135 stores in like a year and a half. Uh, and it was really successful. Warner Brothers retail stores for people old enough to remember those. And we had a policy there that you can return anything, anytime, no question asked, no matter what condition it is. So you could wear your Bugs Bunny t-shirt for a year, come back with paint stays, stains and holes, and we'd say happy to return it. And the idea of that was that if people know that, some people are going to take advantage of it, but then overall, it's going to be like Nordstrom's or Costco, right? So Costco, like I returned something the other day that I bought like a year ago that I just forgot I had uh, and that I never use. But um, so there's something to that. The only problem with jewelry is that, you know, when you get that very expensive piece, you know, it kind of sucks to sell a $5,000 piece and have somebody call and want to ship it back. Um but, you know, I, I think most of the online retailers that are good retailers offer returns uh, as long as the jewelry is in good conditions, et, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd say when in doubt, just take it back if you can. Uh, yeah, actually, all the time, really. Of course, if it, unless it's damaged, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I had a guy the other day come to think of it that um, it was about price. So he bought an item and he paid for it everything was fine talked about how much he loved it how he's been looking for one for years and can't find him um and then he looked up on ebay and he found one for cheaper and this is an item that is known for being faked all over ebay all the time right and i can't tell if the buyer on, on the ebay is selling it fake or not but we're talking about the difference of i don't know a hundred bucks on like a 500 hundred dollar item and so he asked about returning it. And then I'd look at this eBay listing and it just, it just did not seem right. Right. But still I said, you know what? Sometimes we don't know if these are legit on eBay or not. Um, you know, I checked this out. It's legit, but you know what? Happy to take it back. Maybe I could right, have yeah. I don't know, but yeah. In general, take it back. Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, I think a lot of us sometimes are a little nervous because we don't know. Well, you don't really have that so much with vintage jewelry. But, you know, with some of the newer pieces, you know, we worry about it getting switched out with the fake version of whatever it is. Oh, know, like. yeah, true. So. We'll, we'll take really, really good pictures of everything on each piece. And so we actually take more pictures than we post uh, for that reason. And the other thing that I do is oh. we take pictures uh, we take pictures before we send it and on the higher volume items we actually set up a video camera and we video ourselves tape uh, putting it in the box and sealing it and sending it as well uh so yes. this is all backup um uh, but pictures of the clasp every time um mm -hmm. pictures of detail and again any sort of dent or scratch or whatever a picture and show and, and disclose it i think the more you do that the less that's gonna that's gonna happen could somebody switch something out yeah, sure. Um, I don't think I've had that happen, but it would be easier to identify if you had really good pictures and weight. So let's say if you're selling a gold chain and it's 37.3 grams, it's going to be pretty hard for somebody to send back a gold plated chain that looks exactly the same. That's also three millimeters wide. That's 37.3 grams with the same hallmark on it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Okay. Okay. That's a really good tip because I didn't think about taking additional pictures, but just not in, you know, not publicly posting them. And so weight. You have that. Yeah. And the weight. So you have that for your own reference. Right. And then if you get to the stones, diamonds or colored stones, it's important to know the dimensions as well. So, uh, and if it doesn't have any sort of lab paperwork with it, even take a loop up and look and draw out where you think any sort of inclusions would be. So let's say you had like a, a, a circular stone, and you see some big black mark right here. You even draw like an image with a black mark. That'll tell you if the stone coming back to you, if that came back to you is the same stone or not. And if you know that that's 6.3 millimeters wide, you know, and three millimeters deep, et cetera, then that's a way of determining it. You should, it, when you get to stones, if you guys happen to be selling, you know, gemstones, diamonds, et cetera, you should always sell them with dimensions anyways. You know, you shouldn't list okay. them without having dimensions. I don't know if anybody in here is getting selling that type of stone or not, but um, it's a good way, again, to prevent somebody trying to give you back the same or different stone. Yeah, yeah. I think that's pro probably the the biggest fear that a lot of us have is like someone's going to switch something out and, yeah, you know, and, um, you know, and sometimes you have no way of proving it. You just know, you know, and 
but uh, but yeah, those are some really good tips. I think that's something important for us to remember. Yeah, how how do they deal with that? Because even it has it hasn't happened to me. I've heard some stories though, uh, where uh, through whatever platform, um, even your own website, uh, that the credit card company um, will give people their money back, uh, no matter what they say. In some cases, right. Is, is, that's just right. part yeah. of your business, I guess. So. Yeah, so See, I'm worried happen. that that's going to happen to me on the big twenty thousand dollar item, which is going to wipe out all my profits for all the two hundred dollar items. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I mean, but that's what I've heard too. People say, you know, they they fought it. They have proven that somebody did a switcheroo or whatever, or damaged it, and then the person, or sometimes the person will will do a return, and they return an empty box, or they return it with something else in it, just so I've heard that the too. tracking. Yeah, just so the tracking shows, okay, item's been returned, it's been delivered. And then some of, depending on the platform, sometimes the refund is automatic once once it shows as delivered. Well, so, I, um, I have never had a return via the mail, knock on wood, weirdly enough. I've had a few in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, if, if it were me, I would probably videotape opening that box um, with the address label and all that as well, it's just as yeah. I do on the way out, uh, just maybe that'll give you one piece of extra evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are some good tips, you know, and um, yeah, you're lucky mm -hmm. you don't really have to deal with it. It'll you know, happen anyway. at some point. Yeah. Just not yet, but uh, it will happen. I'm sure. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's talk to some, talk about something um, not as scary and yeah, <laughs> that's right. how you organize your, um, your inventory. Like, because a oh, lot no. of us, no. <laughs> well, well, you might you might be have some tips and ideas on that too because I know for me, I I kind of keep everything individually bagged. It has a number on it, has a SKU number, so I can find when somebody buys whatever, I just put it I have it in a box and, you know. So my organization system is very simple. <laughs> but it works. It works. So how do you oh because my, you have well. your your pearls, and then you have your consignment stuff. So how do you keep it all organized? I am the worst person in the world to give advice about organizing this stuff. Um, <laughs> but knowing that, uh, we have been a mess until lately. Uh, and we put some new things in place that I think are working. It's maybe too soon to tell. Um, but we didn't have all that much of a system. We had areas where we kept like items. Um, but with consignment, you got to be really careful because it's not your jewelry, you know, so you really have to make sure that you don't right. lose a piece and whatnot. So, uh, there's two different ways we do it now. And this has really helped out a lot with consignment. We use a software system. So this piece, you won't be able to see the tag, but you see there is a tag. Uh, it's got, uh, on one side, one dash 44. One is the consigner's account number and 44 is an item number. So this is the 44th person that person that thing is a person has consigned and then with the software it's called um resale world uh we can log in and we can put the description all that stuff uh the price and it um syncs with the website and it will then control everything so when we sell it we go into liberty world and we sell it takes this out of inventory and then it even uh gets a check ready to write the consigner so this is a it's made oh, just yeah. for consigner so it's 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 like hands down, there's nothing better. Uh, but it's like, I don't remember how much, maybe like two ninety nine dollars a month or something like that. Um, and then maybe a thousand bucks to set up. So that's with consigner. So the other stuff, the things that we own, so we have, we have four, three or four different categories, consigners, stuff that we own that's not consigned. So um, in that case, we used to not have any system. Uh, but now what we do is we use Airtable. And Airtable is like Excel, but it's a lot easier and friendly and you can customize stuff. And it's think of like a, a grid, like a spreadsheet. And so what we do in Airtable is we have a chart and it tells us um, what the piece is, the characteristics, where we bought it, how much we paid, uh, and anything we happen to know about that piece. And then we give it a SKU number in Airtable. And the SKU number that we use is the, or the uh, kind of the nomenclature, I guess, behind it is we use NK something for necklace. So this would be NK whatever, in this case, NK 132, right? Uh, and then 
on the tag in this case is since it's pearls you got to put like their size and how long it is and what the materials are so this piece then um integrates with our pearl website through a thing called woocommerce and that integrates with our wordpress site and so same sort of thing when it's sold on the website it takes this out of inventory so that's taken care of now the two other categories are pieces that we have that we haven't entered into Airtable or WooCommerce or that aren't consigned. And those, we also put a um, inventory, like an NK number on it, but we just keep it in a separate spreadsheet. And then we kind of start moving stuff over to the e-commerce system. And then the fourth thing is components. The problem with um, what we do, especially with the pearls, but sometimes with like jewelry is I'll buy, um, say, a ring. Uh, quite often this happens where somebody wants to sell me a wedding ring, but it doesn't have the center diamond in it because when the couple got broke up, that one person's like, I'll take the diamond, you take the ring. So I'll buy the ring and the ring will be beautiful. I probably even have one in this box, uh, but it won't have a center stone. So that's called a semi-mount, uh, but it's a great, great opportunity. This you can't see, maybe you can, there's a hole in the middle. So in this case, at some point, I'm going to buy a stone and put it in there and sell a ring, but I need to inventory this until then. Otherwise, when we didn't, we'd have bags of these things and I have no idea what I had. So this is yet another entry that we put into a different air table um, so that um, if I say come across a five millimeter stone, I should be able to look up um, a ring, a semi-mount, see what I have and quickly match. Whereas in the old days, I'd have to grab this baggie and like hope to look through a bunch of these and then get my measuring thing out and see if it matches. And I, I wasted so much time looking for inventory I've or somebody, yeah, somebody would buy something that I already sold. That's happened a lot too. And then I'd have to be apologetic and go back and say, Oh, sorry, we actually don't have that. Uh, but it's still a problem because we've been going through it in, for probably seven or eight months now. Uh, but we have that much inventory, especially in pearls. I mean, I probably, I wouldn't even know. Uh, I, I don't, I think it'd be safe to say a hundred thousand pearls. Um, and and wow. we're trying to inventory all of them and we're going through it, but it's really time consuming, especially when you're taking photographs and measuring each one of them. But the more we do it, the more precise we are, which means it's easier and faster to sell these and know what we have. Uh, and so business has been growing in the same speed that we've been able to manage our inventory. That's overwhelming. Just, just hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you just safes everywhere. That's the problem. It's like, I don't have enough room, uh, you know, for all this stuff. And that's a big cost component too. Now you got to buy safes to put this stuff in uh, and it gets expensive. So make sure you're marking your stuff up enough to pay for all these things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. I want to do something that I think will be fun. And I want to cool. ask you, um, what has been your best sale to date? And then I want you to tell me what has been your worst sale to date. Best will probably be easier to think of. Um, what well, could be best in terms of experience or in terms of money? Uh, yeah, I guess however, however you want to. Yeah, I or have. If there's more than one, you could tell us. Tell I'll tell you a few. Uh, I have got right now a, a sixty thousand dollar diamond for sale, which is a crazy great deal, believe it or not. So it's eight and a half <laughs> carat uh, oval um, M colored SI one, uh, and someone's going to buy that soon, and it's going to be awesome. Imagine that on your ring. It's I think it's on my uh, I think even put on my pearl Instagram page because it's so cool. If you guys want to see how big this thing is. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Um, there's a handful of pieces I've sold that I really like that have been old. Uh, one of my best sales was a necklace that was made by uh, one of the jewelers to the queen. And it had a box that was custom made for it. And it was 22 karat gold with like these dangling you know, rows of gorgeous rubies and very majestic princess like. Uh, and this gorgeous red box where they literally carved the inside of the box to go around each kind of ruby that dangled from this necklace. But here's the thing, a girl buys it and she says, you know, she was trying to think of whether or not she should buy this. I don't remember how much it was, but it was expensive. Going back and forth and kind of talking out loud. And she said, you know what? I think I'm just going to treat myself. And I'm like, great. You know, where are you going to wear it to? She says, well, 
uh, I have cancer and it's really bad and they don't expect me uh, to live past whatever it was, I think like three, four months, something like that. She goes, I can't really, I'm not going to wear it anywhere except for my own house. And I'm going to spend my money on me right now. And I'm going to wear it in my house and I'm going to look at myself in the mirror and think how pretty it is and enjoy this before I die. Isn't that sad? So that was really interesting. Um, she came in to the store. This is when I had retail store, maybe two years later. And I recognized her. I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, everything's fine. It went in remission and I'm all good. So that was pretty neat. Um, That's amazing. I remember you sharing that story. Oh, did I tell you that? Yeah. Uh-huh. So yeah, I think uh, that's a beautiful story because sorry to double it up, but I love that. No, story. no, because so many of us don't do that. I think that's what we talked about last time is that people just keep all these beautiful, gorgeous jewelry pieces in a, in a jewelry box yeah, and they never, know. you know, they never wear it. And then, you know, life is short, you know, yeah. and so we don't get to enjoy it or appreciate it. So I think that's, that's a beautiful story. All right. Well, maybe I told you my worst sale then. I don't know if we have, if we talked about this before. I think my worst sale was when I was first starting, and this is great for you guys that don't feel comfortable with pricing on colored stones like we talked about. I had this, it must have been 150 carat um, aquamarine come in, faceted, um, teardrop shape, and it was really beautiful, but I had just started in the resale business, and uh, at that time I was running a retail consignment store. And so, as I mentioned, I rely on other people to give me advice. So I got this thing in, and I went to one of the Facebook groups and I posted a picture and a video of it and said, okay, I know it's 150 carats. It's an aqua. Here it is. What do you guys suggest I sell it for? Cause I have no idea. And I'm waiting and this one person writes back, he goes, uh, five bucks a carrot, no, two bucks a carrot. That's what he said. Um, and so I'm like, okay, cause I have no idea. Right. And so I wait a few minutes. I see nothing else. And somebody walks in the store and I said, I showed it to him. He goes, wow, that's really beautiful. I said, well, two bucks a carrot and it's yours. So I sold them for, for 300 bucks or whatever it is. I may be off a little bit on the numbers. I don't remember the particulars. Point being uh, is that I took the first advice and I sold it for that. This guy was just screwing with me. And a lot of people online, uh, when you ask their advice, keep in mind, that's often followed up, especially if you're asking pricing advice with, well, I'll just buy it from you for three, you know, it's worth two, but I'll pay you three for it. Uh, and I didn't realize he was doing that. And that piece could probably have been sold for 80 bucks a carat, maybe, um, you know, it could have been eight, $10,000 piece from what I've seen of that same color and that size at like the Tucson gem show and whatnot. Uh, so I sold it for whatever it was, a few hundred bucks. So, Bad sale, but I learned my lesson that when you do get advice, um, there's people in these Facebook groups that have good reputations and there's people that don't, and there's people that you don't know of. Uh, and the more that you participate and start to know names, uh, you'll get to trust a certain amount of people. So now I may post something like now and say, hey, can you guys give me advice? But I have to ignore some of the people and right. the people I know, I know who's going to give me an honest opinion. Yeah. And I guess that comes back to like what we talked about earlier, doing your, your own due diligence and your own research. I so trusted that, way, that everybody online is there to help everybody out. It was very naive, but that's me yeah. sometimes. Well, it's happened to all of us. So, you yeah. know, it's not just you. I think that's just, like you said, it's part of the nature of the business. Right. So, okay. Any um, last tips or advice? or anything that you can share that will encourage us to, you know, to really keep doing this because there's so many of us that love this, but we get overwhelmed or we get discouraged, you know, when things don't happen as quickly or as well as we'd like them to. Yeah. What are your, you know, tips or encouraging words for those of us who want to do this and eventually get to the level that you're doing this at? I, you know, I, I know I'm different because, you know, the, the consignment's slightly different, but, you know, maybe even consider opening up your uh, consignment business and so you don't have to put the capital out as much. That could be one tip. Um, I would say the other thing that I see people making a mistake doing is gold. So when you're out there at an estate sale or, you know, Goodwill or whoever, um, and you're buying gold, we tend to often pay too much for it. 
right? So mm-hmm. and when you're talking about timing, things don't happen as fast. If you're buying jewelry, it's not as much with consignment because I can price stuff a little higher if I'm consigning because I have no risk and it makes both me and the consigner more money. But if I'm buying, um, I think a good rule of thumb is always buy for less than you are absolutely sure you could sell that piece for tomorrow, right? Okay. Not, hey, I think this is a really pretty piece. I think it could get a good premium on it. So I'm going to pay a premium because I think you can get over that. And when it comes to things like gold, we all know how to like look what the price of gold is, right? So uh, if you're going to like a, a estate sale, I've got this portable gold scale, right? And it even has a weight in it so I can calibrate it in front of somebody if they, you know, don't believe me. Or oh, I've said it weird. Or so something. that's another tool we need to, <laughs> we need Everybody to should carry that in their car. Um, so, and then, you know, your own gold testers know how to test gold. You can mm-hmm. you know, go cheap and, and it's fantastic. An acid testing kit. If you learn that great, you can carry that with you. Although somebody at like a garage sales is not going to want you scratching their gold uh, to, to acid. Right. Uh, but there's things like uh, gold testers. I, I brought some of these for you guys. Um, this one is a great one. We have a few different ones. Uh, this is the Jamoro Oracle Pro. Um, I know a girl who host tells these, I can give you her info if you can put it in later on. Um, okay. and then there's the key tester, which is also great. Uh, and a combination of these things, your eyes, the markings on the gold, uh, and an acid test, if you need to, uh, is going to make your buying a little bit better. So once you know your carrot weight and you know how much the item weighs and you've got your scale, any of us can look up and I'm guessing all you guys know how to do that, that the, what that gold prices at the point. So that's called spot price. So what is the gold mm-hmm. worth? But if the gold's worth a thousand dollars via spot, keep in mind, if you want to melt that gold, let's say you couldn't sell it, you couldn't find a buyer. Remember I was saying buy things as if you can sell them tomorrow. Uh, if you can't b- find a buyer, uh, then you may have to melt it. And then you, you want to make it to where if you melt it, you still make money. But when you go to melt it, you're going to pay the refiner for the service of melting it. So you're not going to get the thousand dollars. You're going to get less than that. And it it pays to get to know your local refiners. There's some online refiners that are great too, and see what rate they'll give you in terms of gold. So are they going to give you X percent of the value? And quite often that depends on how much you bring them. So if you're bringing one chain, it's going to be different than if you're bringing, um, you know, 300 grams. Um, So all of that combined means now you know how much to buy that piece for over the counter or a garage sale or whatever. And you're going to hope that they've got like a 14 karat gold chain that's worth $500 listed as 10 bucks. And you just go and offer them eight, you know, but <laughs> just teasing, give them the 10. Um, and that happens all the time. But, um, you know, uh, being smart about what you're buying and paying the right price is, is kind of a lesson I've learned hard because I've overpaid for things that I thought would sell quickly. And I've had to sell them for less later. You know, so, and sometimes you feel weird, especially with me meeting people with some of these high value items that say, yeah, I've got an appraisal for a hundred thousand dollars on it. And then, you know, it's really realistically, I mean, you could sell it for 15, um, then I have to tell them that, but I've learned not to be afraid of that. And just to tell it like it is, uh, and you'd be surprised how much this stuff just, you know, it works. Yeah. So, uh, gold testers, a weighing thingy, what do you call those scale? Um, this guy always great. Uh, and then of course the jeweler's loop, because you're going to need to see all those markings and then yeah, I always keep one in my purse cause you never know. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually what I usually keep on this, I took it off the other day is you can buy, uh, uh, UV lights that are uh keychain size. And I usually keep yep. one on here. That yep. I got one of those too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Speaking of testers, Matt, um, this just came to me. A lot of a lot of uh, jewelry resellers use the Presidium Gem Tester. Have you ever used that? Have you heard of that? Well, they make. It depends on which one. They make many gem testers. So oh, they, okay. See, I've never they used make one for. Yeah, there, there's one that's kind of a generic gem tester, and it'll tell you uh-huh. if, based off of the composition, it's going to be in like the quartz family or sapphire or diamond, but it doesn't distinguish between diamond and moissanite. Um, so that's one of the presidium testers, but there's all sorts of presidium testers. Uh, one that I use a lot is uh, more of a higher end, uh, tester that tells the difference between, uh, uh, moissanite or lab or, uh, natural diamonds. Um, and I don't have it next to me. 
Uh, and I have uh, the one that you're talking about. It's called Gem Tester 2 is might be the one that you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, that's it. That's it. Because that's the one uh, we call it like the starter <laughs> one for yeah, people who are great. just getting into it. But uh, I, I've heard so many mixed um you know, reviews on it. Like some people say, oh, it's right on. And then other people say, oh, this thing is so way off and it doesn't work. So I just wanted to know what your experience was with it. But you think it's you think it's a good investment for. I for learned on that. Yeah. And so um, I think it is because I'll tell you what it does and doesn't do. So it's good for determining kind of the family of what that stone is but it won't distinguish between stones in the same family, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. okay. So for example, I'm just going to grab it. All right. Uh, so for example, looking at it here, it will, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a good example. In the same range that your little arrow will go into, um, you could have a hard time determining between a tourmaline and a tanzanite because the little arrow is going to go into like a little zone where it lists tourmaline, but it also is tanzanite. So in that case, we should all learn how to tell a tourmaline from a tanzanite, right? And, and, and you can just tell generally by the color of in that particular one. Right. Uh, but, it, but a lot of us don't know that. When I was learning, I had no idea. Uh, so this helps you kind of narrow it down. And so once you get into that area, you still have to know in that zone, which is it? And could it be one or another? So for example, uh, an amethyst could also be in the same uh, zone as a tanzanite you know, which might be harder for some people to distinguish. Uh, and then of course you can't rely on it for diamonds because it will call moissanite a diamond and diamond a moissanite. So uh, not good for diamonds. However, it's great for determining if something is crystal or crystal CZ glass, yeah. or a diamond, because if you put the diamond in and people tell you it's diamond and it doesn't even go over to that zone, then you know, it's not a diamond. So okay. it has its place. Let me say that, but, I, but yeah, I've got one. It's this guy right here. Uh, yeah. The, the link that I'm going to give you, I'll call up uh, Alex uh, and she, Alex Kessler, um, and maybe she'll give you guys like the, I don't, I can't promise, but um, the wholesale price on these. If I've heard oh my gosh, that would be I'll, amazing. I'll ask her and at least have her give you a discount. Yeah, uh, coupon code would be great. Yeah, or something. I'll, I'll get her to do something. Yeah, because so many of us, you know, because it's it's kind of a pricey investment if you're just oh. getting started in this. And so we a lot of us are kind of nervous to buy it because we are like, well, if, if we don't know how it works or how to use it, you don't want to drop 300 or however much 500, 600 dollars on yeah. it. I and think it, I think those are like three three fifty, and I think the key is five hundred. I think the mm -hmm. Oracle Pro might be like six hundred. I don't remember. Yeah, but, I've seen them anywhere um, from three on up to about six hundred dollars. And one of my diamond testers is like twelve hundred bucks. Um, but I had to like earn my way through it. Uh, and then the other tester I can recommend if you guys are buying gold coin, which is really important, is the um, oh, why am I remembering the name of it? Sigma. Sigma. Uh, because there's a lot of gold coins that are fake that are coded really well that gold testers won't read oh. through. So it's particularly for gold coins, but I think it's like six, seven, eight hundred dollars unfortunately. Uh, but you mess up on one $2,000 gold coin that's not gold, then, you know, there's your money. Uh, so that's called a Sigma tester. Okay. When and I don't know where, I don't, I actually won mine in a raffle, like a $10. Oh. Raffle, so I, <laughs> I was going to say, can you, will you be able to tell us where to get that too? Google it. I have no idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it yeah. up. So, okay. All right. So, wow. You gave us so many uh, nuggets. <laughs> in <Totally> this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This has been fantastic. So, all right, Matt. Well, uh, anything else uh, you want to well, think um, there before we close out, you know, I love talking to you. So, so do you get comments later when you put this up in the chat? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do. Yeah. Like that's what happened on the last one is so huh. many people watched it. And then I, there was uh, comments left on the video. And then like I shared my girlfriend, she watched it or maybe she listened to it. And then she messaged me. She said, hey, can you ask him this? Because she yeah, knew I'd I was be having curious, the back. Can I ask the audience something? And you guys Absolutely. Put, put this in the comments later if, if you're willing to participate. Because I'm really curious on two topics. One is what we talked about before. How have you handled or do you have any ways of mitigating this uh, potential for these returns, right? You know, what mm -hmm. do you do if there's anything or what have you been able to say to a credit card company? Is there any tips or tricks to keep this from happening? Because I think everybody's 
really interested in happening that happening. The other thing is, yeah, I'm curious about these goodwill bags because I see a lot of people that are resellers buying like the uh, the the grab bags, and I'm just saying my opinion on them is that I think if you're in this just for fun, great, but if you're in this to make money, I don't know if it's worth your time. Um, this is my notion because I've never bought one. I, I wonder if it's really worth your time to buy these go through them, see what you have and try to sell stuff because a lot of the little things might be like $3 worth of silver. So I'm curious if anybody's actually had success uh, in buying uh, these Goodwill bags. Do they still do those where you buy like- Oh the yeah, as a matter of fact, I did a whole podcast episode on <laughs> on buying these uh, jewelry bags, oh, okay. boxes and lots because uh, that's how a lot of us get started, right? Yeah. Because we don't know what the heck we're doing and we just see- you know, oh, let's let's buy a five pound bag of jewelry and dig through it. And then you'll you'll watch YouTube videos where someone will find something amazing, you know, in in a bag or in a mystery box or a lot. Um, but it, yeah, if you're going to do this as a business, I agree. I don't believe that is probably the best way to spend your time and your money. But like you said, if you're just doing this for fun and you just want to see what you get and, and you enjoy the thrill of the surprise, uh, sure, sure, it could be. But I don't know if it's necessarily the best um, way to get inventory for a profitable business. Yeah, I would imagine like estate sales are a really good way to do that, uh, which reminds me, the third thing, if you guys want to uh, <laughs> participate is I'd be curious to know what your biggest win was in terms of buying something anywhere. It could be Goodwill, it could be a state sale or whatever, like the guy that bought the $12 pearls that were, you know, several thousand dollars. I'd be curious to see, is that happening out there? Is it just Andy here in town that gets lucky all the time? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, it, it does happen. Um, you know, and I think that for a lot of us, that's what kind of drives us, you know, especially mm -hmm. is because you kind of, you're on that chase of like, yes, I want something amazing. You know, I want to, <laughs> I want to be able to move into a mansion because I find something so extraordinary. But uh... here's the one good thing about not, <laughs> the one good thing about not knowing about these stones and like what, what um, exactly what you have in a category is uh, right when I got started, this maybe makes up for that, um, that um, aquamarine. There's a person that came in and he had this ring and a bracelet, a matching bracelet. And he said, I'd like to sell this uh, topaz ring and bracelet. And I looked at him and um, I don't know much about topaz. I mean, I know that I've seen topaz and I've seen like, like kind of a creamy, milky kind of look. Uh, I knew there's also blue topaz, but this was kind of yellowish. And I said, well, okay, I know that topaz isn't worth a lot of money. Uh, but they're in gold and some of them had a few little like diamonds on it. So I took a look at it and I kind of evaluated how much gold's in there. I figured the topaz, you know, for, it's not really worth anything. Let's just price it off of the gold on the, on the, on the ring and the bracelet. And I consigned it. So it sat in my case for like four or five months. And we like to only keep things for three months, but I felt bad for this guy and it wasn't selling. And we kept reducing the price and reducing the price. Uh, and then finally, um, I called him. I said, you know, they're just not selling, but I'll tell you what, I'll just buy them. And so I just personally said, I'll, I'll take them. And because uh, I just I didn't want to return these things after having six months and not being successful. And that's not, I'm a sucker for that sometimes. So I got a drawers full of that. Anyways, so I did so. And they sat for years and I forgot about them. And maybe a year ago, uh, I was going through stuff and I found them. I'm like, you know, now that I know so much more I think those might be sapphires. And so I tested them and sure enough, they're sapphires. Then I sent them to GIA. And not only they're sapphires, they're Sri Lankan sapphires that aren't treated. Uh, and they're one of them's 20 carats. The other was like 14 carats or something like that. Uh, and those could be sold probably close to a thousand dollars a carat. So uh, whereas I think I paid like 120 bucks for one ring and 200 for the bracelet or something like that. So isn't that interesting? Oh, uh, and yeah. my knowledge made me think of that, which brings up one more thing. I'm sorry to keep this going. One more tester that you should learn in the cheap is a refractometer. If you really want to get good at colored stones, you can buy these on Amazon and it okay. is a way to determine distinctly what your colored stone is by putting a chemical on the, the instrument and putting your stone on it and looking at the disbursement of, um, of light rays. It's called a refractometer. Oh, refractometer. Okay. Probably under a hundred bucks. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll look that up too. Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's quite a few tools that I think then, because I, I have a list of tools that I use too, but you've 
introduce a couple of new ones to me today. So I'll make sure that I research those, you know, because anything to help us do this better, you know, anything, anything, (laughs) you know, to help me do what I do better, to to have a little bit of an edge, to have more knowledge, more, you know, experience. Yeah. And that's how I determined those sapphires were sapphires was I got out my refractometer once I had it, knew how to use it. All right. Awesome. So I guess we will uh, close out with that. Till next time. Yeah. 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 I know. So, um, uh, oh, and here's what I'm going to ask everybody. If you guys want Matt to do a live Q&A, because we talked about this, uh, leave that in the comments as well. And then Uh-oh. maybe I can maybe I can convince him <laughs> to come back and do a live Q&A with us. <laughs> I love doing lives. <laughs> yeah. You know, I love doing lives, too. So um, I think that would be a lot of fun and um, we can get a lot of people here and you probably will be just bombarded with questions. But. I think you can handle it. (laughs) That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate your time and, uh, you know, just sharing, being so generous with your information and your knowledge. So uh, thank you again. And until next time. Thanks, everybody.